Hello. All right. I am Toma, and uh, I am super excited to get to talk with you all today about uh, this paper, um, Erasure Coded Raft. Um, so, also, please forgive me, this is my first time speaking in public, so I will be nervous, but uh, I will do my best to uh, stay focused and, uh, and actually like uh, provide a good explanation. So, let's get to it. Erasure Coded Raft um, is a um, is it so? So raft is a um, method of keeping a group of different uh, servers all kind of in coordination with each other. So this would this would be in an environment where you have um, some amount of information that you need to keep uh, in coordination with each other shared across a large number of different servers. And you, what you want to be able to do is to write a change, for instance, updating your password. And you want it to uh, be the same across all these servers, because you don't want to read from one and it says that your password is one thing, read from another, and it says that it's another thing. Um, so Raft um, aims to be a kind of like simple way to make that happen. And it includes a handful of important key elements. Um, one of those is leader elections. The leader is the member of a raft cluster that is uh, permitted to make rights. If you could have any of them uh, making rights uh, to the same uh, you know, password or other uh, piece of data at the same time, it would be much, much harder to get agreement upon like what the state of the world should be. So one of the key parts of Raft is that amongst all the members, you have an election and at any one time, you only have one leader. Um, one of the other uh, key pieces is that you have this two-phase commit um, way of changing data. So whenever a, uh, a leader has been elected and then they get a, a, a right from the client that says, I want to change this piece of information, um, they first, they don't just say, hey, the information has changed. First, they send out a message to all of the other uh, servers that are uh, participating in the cluster, and they say, hey, um, here's a proposed change. And the other servers can, can uh, respond and either say, yes, this looks good, acknowledged, or they can write back and say, denied. You know, for whatever reason, maybe it's denied, um, a new leader has been elected. You're no longer the leader, or maybe it's like uh, denied this. You know, this data wasn't correctly formed. But for whatever reason, they can say no. That's not true. And in order to actually make the right, then um, they have to get a strict majority of responses saying yes, I accept that right. Then they send out a second message that says, okay, commit the change. And only when servers receive the commit message do they actually like update their state to the new, the new piece of data, the new password, the new configuration, you know, value, whatever it is. And um, the, the thing that this uh, accomplishes most importantly is that um, some number of members of the cluster can be unavailable. You know, they could be down. They maybe they're restarting. Maybe there's a network outage, and like you know, one or or some number of them aren't actually able to connect to the others at any given time. And what you what you get is that uh, as long as there aren't too many failures, you're still able to write data um, between them. So what that looks like is. You know, you have you have a leader that um, is able to connect to and and to and to win an election from at least you know fifty percent of the members of the cluster. So uh, on the left, um, A is not able to talk to B or C, 
Um, so B or C could become the leader because either B or C um, would start an election, vote for themselves, and then they would be able to get a vote from the other one. So if C, um, you know, C could become the leader by voting for itself, starting an election, voting for itself, and sending out uh, messages. It would attempt to send one to A, attempt to send one to B. A would never respond, but B would respond and say, like, yes, acknowledged. Um, and so C could become the leader. Um, and A, on the other hand, hasn't heard from B or C. You know, it hasn't heard from anyone else, whoever the pre prior leader was. So A would probably also start an election, and it would try to send messages out to B and C. It would vote for itself. It would never get any responses from B and C, and so it would never be able to get more than 50% of the vote. And so A would never think that it was the leader and try to write data. So, uh, and then, you know, let's say something changes over time. Um, C is now unavailable. A and B are able to talk to each other. Um, C would not be able to be the leader. If it was the leader whenever this happened, then at a certain point, it, or, well, if it accepted any incoming rights, those rights would have to be proposed to the other servers, and once again would have to get, you know, 50% or more acknowledgements, and it wouldn't be able to. And so, so while this was the state of affairs, if C tried to write changes to the cluster, it would be unable to, and it would, and it would refuse. A or B, in the meantime, could become the leader and could accept rights, and basically at some point in the future, whenever uh, uh, all of them reconnect or whenever it changes, then the the fifty percent uh, or greater guarantee, or greater than fifty percent guarantee, means that any way that you partition it, there is at least one server that's in that's a member of the majority that has the most up to date information about what's going on in the cluster. So you can never lose data; it can never accidentally get rolled back. Um, so this is like. There, there's a lot more to raft than this. It like it in its own right is is pretty complicated, and you know there's a lot going on there. There are some really great resources um, on the internet about how to understand like raft itself, um, the core underlying protocol. Um, Raft.github.io has uh, the uh, a link to the original paper and links out to other resources. Uh, one of the ones that helped me a whole lot was at thesecretlivesofdata.com slash raft, which includes a uh, visual, uh, you know, representation of, of like how a raft cluster uh, sends messages around for both updating data and conducting elections. Um, so to get a little background on raft itself, uh, you know, you can absolutely go and check those out. Um, those are really cool. But um, I am sprinting through that and glossing over it because uh, what we are talking about today is the craft paper, <laughs> um, which is a really great name, but also makes it uh, completely impossible uh, to uh, search for. <laughs> so we've got a link up in the, uh, in the Twitch uh, page. But, uh, but yeah, so what, what is the... Um, you know, the craft is uh, titled an erasure coded, an erasure coding supported version of Raft for reducing storage cost and network cost. So, uh, the first important part of understanding, like, what is the difference between this and normal Raft, is understanding like, what are erasure codes? Why do we want to support them? So, um, erasure codes are a type of what's called a forward error correction code, um, and forward error correction codes are extra data that gets um, added in to a message, into a, into a byte string, um, so that if parts of the message are lost, you can um, A, figure out that there are errors. Um, uh, the, you know, this is like parity bits and things like that. Um, and uh, the, the neat thing about error correction codes beyond just or be, uh, the great thing about uh, error correction or forward error correction codes 
beyond just simple parity bits is a parity bit can tell you um, was their data error. And, and that allows you to know when do you need to request that the data is like resent. But uh, uh, forward error correction codes can actually allow you to take the the corrupted data that you were sent, and as long as it's not too corrupted, as long, as long as there's a small number of errors, it can actually fix them without having to uh, retransmit the data. Um, so the um, one of the common types of uh, forward error correction codes, and one that's kind of like easy to explain and talk about, are called Hamming codes. And Hamming codes, uh, the, the, the basic idea is that when you are writing a message, you take your, your binary data, um, you know, zeros and ones, and um, instead of having a single parity bit, which would take a string, you know, you might have uh, seven, you know, binary digits for, for a regular parity bit, and you add them up. And if you're if you're doing um, you know, odd uh, parity bits, then you take that sum and you figure out is it even or odd, and then you add either a zero or one to it to make sure that it's always odd. Um, voila. So then, if you get a transmission and it's an even number, you know that there was an error. Um, so so that's just the the super basic single parity bit. Um, but with this, you have these parity bits, and uh, in this chart, where the x's are um, covers a single parity bit, and then all of the data bits that that parity bit checks. And so the, the parity bit acts for those um, you know pieces of the message the same way that the single parity bit um, worked for the whole thing. Um, the cool thing with this is if you check um, all of the parity bits, then they actually tell you uh, which bit is flipped, including the parity bits themselves. If um, you know, so, so um, let's see. Um, I uh, I kind of like to work through an error on here, but <laughs> drawing. Uh, in uh, Twitch is uh, particularly hard, and uh, I don't know that talking through this is actually going to illuminate it. So um, basically, the important thing to understand is that um, when you have a code like this, uh, it could be small, like a 7.4, where you have uh, uh, four bits of data out of seven total bits, and then you break your, your entire message up into seven bit chunks, um, or you, 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 you break your data into four bit chunks and you add in three parity bits for each and you transmit all that. And then you, do, you don't have to retransmit, you fire once. And then um, on the other end, uh, the receiver is able to check the parity bits, correct any errors that were made and reconstruct the whole message. Um, so, that's um, that's kind of the important thing to understand with a forward erasure code. So the uh, the the thing that this doesn't help you with is that um, Hamming codes can only for for a particular you know uh, uh, message it can only correct one error, um, and that's where. Uh, things like Reed Solomon codes come in. So Reed Solomon codes are what are called um, erasure codes, which uh, go a step further than uh, Hamming codes or regular uh, forward error correction codes. So the um, they're much more mathematically complex. Um, they're used in a whole lot of uh, different technologies, uh, CDs, DVDs, QR codes, and... Uh, like space radio transmissions, but the um, the thing that you get with uh, RS codes is that you can generally tell where um, an erasure happened, and if you can tell like which bits were lost, like which chunks were lost, then you can actually 
um, reconstitute the original message out of um, a relatively small number of pieces of the uh, of the whole message. So the um, so. When you have, um, you you basically have a, a pre agreed upon function between the sender and the receiver uh, to encode and decode uh, the message, and your data gets uh, broken up into uh, pieces so that uh, whenever they get sent, um, you have you have your data and you have your parity bits. And the other thing that RS codes do. Uh, a little differently from Hamming codes is that all the parity bits uh, go on the end, and so you're able to identify, you know, uh, these pieces of the um, of the message that I'm sending are data. Um, these pieces are parity, um, but in the end, it actually kind of doesn't uh, matter. Also, because as long as you get enough pieces, then uh, you can you're able to reconstruct your data. Um, out of any of them, you know, even if it doesn't include any of the original data. So you might have something like this, where you break that, your message up into four pieces. You calculate two um, uh, parity uh, components, and then you send them all over the wire. And let's say two are missing. You still have uh, four pieces, which is enough to uh, reconstruct the original message. Um, the Hamming codes are a little hard to explain uh, verbally. These um, are one of the parts of this whole thing where um, I was not able to actually figure, figure it out. It uses uh, finite field math and a thing called a Vandemort matrix in order to uh, calculate what the parity bits are. So uh, that uh, ended up being a little bit uh, beyond my ken, but the um, the idea that we got, or the, the idea that uh, uh, that I've been able to get of uh, RS codes, um, you know, can be usefully summed up this way. Uh, the analogy uh, that was drawn to help uh, explain it is basically like uh, think of a line. You have um, some number of points that define the line. And uh, so for a for a line, a first degree polynomial, like y equals x, um, you can have two points, and those points will define the line. And uh, for a third degree polynomial, it might be four points. Um, but if you add a lot more points, what you uh, called oversampling, then um, you're still defining the same line. And then, you uh, you was some, but that's fine. Hey, it's actually fine because you're able to to uh, to still draw the same line based on a different set of points as long as those points were still along the line. Um, there's a blog uh, on Medium introduction to Reed Solomon that discusses this uh, more in depth by uh, Jeff Wendling. There's also there's a lot of uh, good resources out there for like explaining how. Uh, Read Solomon encoding itself works. Uh, but what does this have to do with RAP? Like, how does this um, like change anything about uh, how a raft cluster might work? Normal raft clusters um, use quite a bit of storage and network bandwidth. Let's say you have a single server that's running your database. You write 100 gigabyte payload to it. 100 gigabytes of data is transmitted over the wire and stored on the server. Um, and this uh, setup has no fault tolerance. If the, if the server goes down, your data is um, at least unavailable, maybe lost forever, uh, depending on the nature of the fault. Um, if you want to make a raft cluster that can handle having one server fail, then you need to have three nodes. 
for your 100 gigabyte uh, data that you want to save uh, to the database, you actually end up transmitting 300 gigabytes of data over the wire and storing yeah, and using up 300 gigabytes worth of uh, storage media. If you want to be able to have three servers fail at the same time or, or three like network segments fail at the same time, you have to have seven nodes. Um, and so now and so now you've got a 7x you know multiple on how much data is transmitted and stored. These can get arbitrarily large. The um, I don't actually know, you know, for for a um, you know for for a large company like a Fang or something like that, um, I I don't know how large their Raft clusters actually get, because one of the things um, about Raft is also that it's slow. If you have to have all at least a majority of uh, servers in the cluster agree uh, synchronously on um, any change that's proposed, then that takes a really long time compared to something that would be able to just like optimistically write and then you know the servers communicate amongst themselves after uh, the write has been accepted and you know everything you're like if you if you're if you're optimistic about it and you and you say like yeah this this right happened um, without checking with the other servers then um, you're able to return really quickly but if you have to actually check in with the others and do this like two phase commit thing that raft requires and also you know like leader elections if the leader uh, needs to change or something like that then then like, that's going to be much much slower so you don't use this for um, you know normal large scale data. You use it for um, really important configurations. This is why I chose passwords as like the common example. Um, you know, you use it for really important small pieces of data that are um, really important not to mess up. And um, and so these you know these types of clusters can get arbitrarily large. I don't know that they actually get um, super duper large, but um, the fact that speed is a problem with them is uh, something that we can benefit. You know, it's like if, you, if, you're, if you're able to make it faster, then you might um, be able to either use this more commonly or, you know, it'll be less burdensome in those cases where you do actually have to, uh, have to use it. So what if we um, add RS codes to the mix, what would that uh, what would that change? Instead of storing the whole payload on each server in the cluster, um, we would be able to store one um, fragment on each of the servers, and then um, read them back and reconstruct the original message. As long as we're able to get enough of the pieces, so that means each uh, each server would you know uh, use less storage each network transmission would send less data um, so let's say we just go ahead and do raft like normal but we use rs coded data um, so in a in a raft cluster if you want to be able to tolerate a number of faults let's call that f um, then you need um, you need to have at least f plus one um, servers available at any time. So uh, the number of members in your cluster is two f plus one. This is where I got the numbers. Where like if you want to be able to tolerate three faults, you need seven servers. So um, as long as you don't have a majority of your servers failing at a time, it'll be able to work. Okay. So when we when we do this with RS coded data. We take our original data. Let's say we set k equals two because we have three servers. Um, so we have we divide our original data in half, and then we calculate one uh, parity component. And so we have three fragments. Um, each one of them is half the size of our original data. So we write them uh, to the servers, and we. Um, 
and we so we in this in this setup um, each of the servers stores half the data. Let's say if we're if we're talking about that fifty gig payload, which is unrealistically large for a single one, but let's aggregate it together. So in regular Raft, we would be using uh, three hundred gigabytes of storage in this uh, setup and transmitting three hundred gigabytes over the wire. In this case, um, each of these is 50 gigabytes, so we're only storing 150. So um, that's like half as much storage, half as much uh, data transmitted over the wire. Great. So what do we do when we need to, to read? Um, oh, one of the servers is down. We can tolerate a failure. We get back um, two of the, of the fragments. And because k was equal to two, the uh, uh, the, the kind of like magic number for the for the uh, read Solomon codes that uh, determines how many uh, pieces you have to recover. We got them. Great, we're able to reconstitute our original uh, fragment even while one server was or our, our original data even while one server was done. Yay, um, that worked. Awesome. Uh, what if we're trying to write during partition? Because one of the one of the benefits of Raft is that you're able to uh, continue reading and writing um, even while there are up to F uh, servers that are either like down or uh, cut off from the network or you know unavailable in, in one form or fashion. Okay, so you take your original data, you encode it, you've got your three fragments, you go to write them, um, you have a leader, so they're able to issue these writes. Um, you know, they write one fragment to themselves, one fragment to the other one that's available. They try to write the third fragment to the third server, but it doesn't go through. And then let's say you go to read and the uh, partitioning has changed. Um, so now this bottom server is unavailable to the other two. Uh, depending on which server you read from, you might get zero fragments or one, um, but in no case uh, is any uh, server able to get at least two, so fail. You're not able to. Uh, you're not able to actually reconstruct your data, even though the write appeared successful. So this is uh, one of the core things that the paper was talking about: is the idea that um, the the naive approach to adding uh, RS codes to um, to a raft. Uh, algorithm does not keep the failure tolerance that Raft provides. So, so they they kind of talk about uh, RX Paso, uh, RS Paxos. So Paxos is another um, uh, kind of like class of algorithms for keeping the data on a distributed system uh, in sync with each other. And um, there's a, there was kind of like an experiment saying. Oh, if you if you add RS codes to Paxos, uh, it speeds it up by this amount. Okay, that's great, but it dramatically reduces uh, the failure tolerance because of that scenario that that we just walked through, where um, if you write during partition and then you try to read during a different uh, partition when the when the servers haven't had a chance to um, you know propagate all of the all of the writes, then you can have a, uh, a scenario where you had what looked like a successful write um, and then have a read fail. Um, so uh, here we are actually at <laughs> the proposal uh, from the, uh, the, the uh, CRAFT paper. And that is that you've got two different uh, strategies that you use and you select uh, which strategy you're going to use d depending on um, the most recent kind of like estimate of the availability of the cluster. Um, reminder, K is the number of uh, data blocks where, where you, you uh, for RS coding, um, you chop your original data into K pieces. Um, and then you, you have a uh, cluster that is has 2F plus 1 servers in it, and um, you add parity blocks to your data um, so that 
uh, the, the total number of blocks, data and parity is equal to n. There's one for every server. Um, so um, the RS code strategy is what we talked about in that uh, simpler analogy. So you, uh, oh, I, I've got a, I've got a, a little error in here. This, this should be uh, f plus k uh, is less than the total number of servers. So um, when, you're, when you're choosing uh, how many data blocks and how many parity blocks for your RS codes, um, you choose k so that um, the number of failures that you can uh, tolerate plus the number of data blocks that you have to recover in order to re uh, reconstitute your message is less than the, the total number of servers in your cluster. So let's say you've got a, you've got seven servers in your cluster. Um, for for that, you'll be able to tolerate three failures. And let's pick k equals two. You get to pick k uh, when you're setting up uh, this system. And f plus k equals five. Um, ignore the typo. Um, so now each packet is half of the original size. And so as before, um, when you store you know, half as much data on seven servers, you use 3.5 times as much space as a single server. But if you were doing this in normal RAF, you would be using seven times as much. Um, and this number uh, f plus k is five, is um, when, that, that's how you determine like when you would use RS codes. Um, so can we do this safely? We saw, we saw how it was unsafe uh, in another circumstance. Um, so as long as there are f plus k alive, so five, so we could, we could have drawn this where two were even cut off. Um, we're like, okay, yeah, we believe that we can still do the RS code strategy safely. So we write, um, we, have, we have all of our fragments here, two um, data fragments, and then uh, five parity fragments. And we write each of them out to servers. One of them doesn't make it, or two of them um, might not make it. Uh, in this case, but then we go to read again, and, and just like the uh, the other example that that I showed, uh, let's say this is like your worst case of a partition switch. Um, all of the servers that were unavailable before are now available, and um, you have a, a set. You have the maximum number of failures of of a different uh, set of servers. Um, so if, if uh, two servers had, or had uh, previously become available, it would be even more dire than this. There would only be two fragments that you would be able to recover uh, in this case. But because we chose k equal to two, as long as you get two fragments, you're still able to recover the original data. So hey, that actually worked. Um, so as long as we're able to write a sufficient uh, number of fragments um, greater than f plus one, um, but but like predict you, there's a there's a predictable subset where where you'd be able to to actually you know uh, do this, then yeah, you can be confident that you won't get into that scenario that we saw before where you thought you had a good write but you actually didn't. So okay. Um, that's, uh, that's cool whenever you, uh, have a small number of failures in your cluster, but in order to maintain the, uh, the, the checks that, uh, Raft, uh, provide, or the, the, uh, the guarantees that Raft provides about failure tolerance, then you need to be able to still do something, you know, successfully whenever there's a larger number of failures up to, you know, F. Okay, so we've got our seven node cluster again. We have a failure tolerance of three, K equals two, so same settings as before. Um, and let's say at this time, uh, three servers are down. Um, the, the leader would basically be keeping tags, tabs on um, health checks to these other servers and it'll say, recently um, 
I have not seen um, F plus K servers alive. I've only seen, you know, I have, there, there, there are not uh, five healthy servers. There are only four. So we're not going to use the uh, RS code strategy. Uh, we're going to write the whole payload like in uh, normal raft. Um, so it takes the whole thing. It saves that onto all of the, uh, or onto, onto um, n minus f plus k uh, servers. Um, in this case, uh, it, it'll save that onto four of them. And, and then later, if the other servers come up during normal operation, it'll fill the other servers in with fragments instead of filling them in with um, uh, complete copies or complete entries. This, uh, this strategy is called complete, en complete entry replication. Um, so no matter which way you um, partition this after write, there will always be at least one whole copy of the data available, and uh, there will be some number of fragments available. Um, but um, even if the partition happened really quickly, like we were talking about in the other cases, you didn't get to write all the fragments yet, there will be at least one server in the cluster that has the whole original payload, and so you're going to be able to read back your data. And so this uh, preserves the safety uh, guarantees that you got from Raft. And that's the whole shebang. Um, so uh, this was a really short, <laughs> uh, really quick talk. And uh, thank you all for uh, listening in. Um, happy to take uh, questions if anybody has any now. Hopefully I didn't completely lose everyone. <laughs> Oh, okay. I, uh, I can't scroll back. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Triconto. Can the receiver tell if there are too many errors, um, even if they can't reconstruct it? Um, so, um, yes. So, so like, let's say with, uh, with Hammond codes, um, with the parity bits, um, you are able uh, to tell. Let's see. Actually, I don't want to. I don't want to tell you wrong. Um, I am not sure off the top of my head um, uh, if you can tell uh, how many, or like if there are too many errors in Hamming codes. Um, Good, good question. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I am I am not sure. So, uh, performance impact on encode decode on a large cluster. Um, so. The encode decode performance for RS codes is um, it it takes uh, it, it it it's a lot of like CPU bound work that has to happen. It's a lot of like matrix math and things like that. But when you're talking about a large cluster, 
you are trading CPU bound work uh, in order to do less IO. And generally, um, in most scenarios, uh, IO is going to be much, much slower. Um, so RS codes um, are something where even maybe like, I don't know, 10 uh, years ago or something like that, uh, they were kind of like prohibitively computationally expensive. And so a lot of the work was done on like dedicated chips um, or something like that. But like commodity grade computers at this point are able to do matrix math uh, well enough that generally it's a good, yeah, yeah, throw it in, yeah, throw a GPU on there, just do it there. Um, yeah, but even, I mean, like, yeah, with a GPU, without a GPU, uh, something like that, um, uh, CPU bound matrix map is, is generally going to be. Um, any system using, uh, using uh, uh, this um, uh, CRAFT, so, I suspect no, um, because this paper was actually just published in February. Um, and so I don't know what, um, uh, I don't know what if any systems use like RS Paxos. Um, yeah, I just, I, just, I just don't know. I, I, I suspect the answer is, is probably no, because this is pretty new stuff. Um, Is there any open source implementation for the same? Um, <laughs> I'm working on one. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not there yet, so I haven't actually implemented any of this. Um, I have a uh, a project uh, called uh, LeafDB where I'm planning on um, making an open source uh, implementation of this. Um, I don't know, I don't think that the authors of the paper have open sourced uh, theirs. Um, so I don't, I don't know of any uh, open source implementations right now. I'm planning on doing one. <laughs> uh, do you know how folks usually tune uh, what a reasonable value for fault tolerance F is? Um, so, I think um, my understanding of that is that that's like um, something that where gen generally people will say like um, you know we're operating this kind of data center and and we we either see or expect to see um, you know this many failures or something like that. And so uh, they kind of like design their system to accommodate. But in terms of tuning what F is, um, a lot of times I think people do this in a kind of responsive way where um, if they start seeing their clusters become unavailable because they don't have enough members, then they'll add members to their cluster. And so things kind of like grow over time. <laughs> yep. Yes, <laughs> incident incident driven configuration. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. I mean, like you you see this with you know auto scaling groups on your you know AWS uh, database cluster or something like that. Um, so so yeah. I, I um, a lot of raft clusters. So 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 a common example of a production you know where where you might see a raft in a production environment is. Well, so it's not exactly Raft, but like Zookeeper uh, operates in, on a really uh, similar uh, principle. Um, Console from HashiCorp does actually use Raft itself. Um, and what these are used for is to maintain the configuration for the rest of your cluster. So like, let's say you have a large like Postgres uh, cluster or a Mongo cluster or something like that. And you have the configuration for like, what are the members? What are their secrets? Um, you know, things like that. Um, you would store membership and secrets in your Raft cluster, and then you have your big, like, less uh, guarantees, 
uh, based cluster that's actually running your your large scale data. Um, and so a lot of times you just need those to be able to be uh, recoverable. And so you see a lot of production graph systems that have three members. Yeah, CockroachDB, uh, based here in, in New York, uh, uses Raft. That's a good example. Um, yep. Yes, thanks. Yep, Zab is the name of the uh, 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 of the algorithm that Zookeeper uses. Yes. Uh, RS codes are used heavily for distributed storage. Yeah, okay, so um, for use of uh, RS codes, um, RS codes, uh, apart from Raft, are used in lots of you know, systems. I mentioned uh, 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 where was it? Um, yeah, uh, so QR codes uh, use uh, uh, use RS encoding, uh, DVDs, NASA, um, but uh, most of these are not like uh, distributed uh, uh, consensus uh, applications. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, RS code stuff is is used for uh, uh, wireless transmission. You know, in order to 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 make sure that you can uh, deal with you know, wireless transmission is inherently extremely lossy. So, yeah. All right. Any other questions or? <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, for being gracious for my first talk. I appreciate you all uh, very much. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Oh, let's see. Not a question, but an observation. I think it's pretty interesting to see how the error correcting coding is composed atop a network layer that's guaranteed to deliver uncorrupted packets. Uh, in other places, I think we see the inverse relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so syntax coloring that like that totally makes sense. The um, it's constructed on top of. TCP and so TCP is guaranteed to um, deliver uncorrupted packets because it uses um, a strategy that's actually like kind of related itself under the hood. But uh, the type of failures that we're talking about here is where TCP isn't able to do the work uh, for you because um, the servers are, are completely unavailable. So there is no retry, there is no transmission, anything like that. There's there's wholly unavailable. Uh, chunks of data, so but yeah, you're you're right about uh, it being an interesting inversion of the uh, the typical like way of handling these things. Yep. All right. Thank you all so much, and have a good evening.